Hello everyone, it's Douglas C. Welch. Welcome back to the Dog Days of Podcasting Day 7. As you might be able to hear, we are sitting out here in my lovely back garden. So you'll probably hear the airplanes and the helicopters and an annoying bird on occasion. We'll see if he comes back. I was trying to record earlier and he was rhythmically chirping every so often. Um, this is a bit of a talky episode. I don't do a lot of those uh, really in any of my podcasts. I used to do more of them in the gardening podcast, but recently it's been more... Um, different types of videos, lots of pre-written stuff as my career opportunities column is, and on the gardening side, I've just been doing um, much more video than I do anything else with that podcast. It's been a busy, well, a couple of weeks here, really. Had a uh, meeting with a new media consulting client today. Uh, it's quite a different world from the old computer consulting that I used to do. I moved away from that oh, over the course of the last two years. With um, computer consulting, I often describe myself as being a, a computer janitor. If you needed me, you really needed me, so you picked up the phone and you called. I went over and I did the work. New media consulting is much more um, cajoling, convincing, uh, <laughs> collecting data to show people how useful new media can be in their lives and their careers and for their businesses and projects. Uh, it takes a lot of convincing. It takes a lot of teaching, a lot of education, a lot of... Educating people about what new media can do for them, it's more than just Facebook and Twitter updates about what they had for lunch. Uh, there's ways of using it to help spread the message, tell people what they do and how well they do it, which is something I preach all the time in my career talks. Uh, but boy, it can be tiring sometimes. Um, you have to answer a lot of questions. You have to constantly keep up on research that's going around out there about how to effectively use these tools and also develop own ways um, for using them yourself. A, a large part of why I continue podcasting and doing YouTube videos and other things is as an example to my clients to say, here's how I'm using them. You don't have to use it in the same way, but here are some real-time examples of how you can use them. This is how many viewers I get. This is how many listens I get to each podcast so on and so forth. It's kind of a, a teaching tool and a sales tool for working with people in new media. It is it is tough, though, I must admit. Uh, over the last two years, I've been kind of slowly divesting myself from the computer world and moving into this new world, and it's a lot of work, um, as is any career transition. Um, some people think it's not that much of a transition. I'm still a consultant, but there's there's quite a few differences between the two worlds that... Um, really become clear once you dig into it and start to do it. So that's one thing that's taking up a lot of my time. Um, another thing I've been working on, I just been kind of floated the boat with on, um, floated the boat or floated the balloon with on my Career Opportunities blog, is perhaps thinking of a Patreon uh, fundraising plan for my podcast. In the past, when I had higher income with the career, um, um, sorry, with the computer consulting, I was basically using that to subsidize the podcast. I used to get paid for writing Career Opportunities as a weekly column, and that stipend was nice. It basically covered all my hosting and, and, and even a lot of my time spent writing, and that was very nice. But, of course, they went out of business back in uh, 2007, the print magazine, that is, and I've continued on doing it myself on my own time for my own reasons uh, for the last seven years. Now, I realize I didn't realize it had been that long. Um, Patreon's an interesting system. It's one of the first systems I've seen that seems workable as far as an ongoing funding method. Obviously, if you already have a, a large number of followers or listeners, it's going to be a lot easier to set one up than it is if you're trying to uh, start something with, you know, let's say I have a thousand subs. I think I, at one point I figured out feed burner. It said I had 2,000 subs on the feed way back when. Um, it can be tougher because you just don't have a big of an audience to, to reach out to. Um, but what I'm finding is I'm going to have to find some ways of making the podcast a little, at least a little more self-supporting, or I'm just going to have to stop doing them because I can no longer, I don't have the income to subsidize them like I did in the past with my time, with my energy, with my money to provide hosting and stuff like that. I would never, ever, ever use that as part of any fundraising plan. You know, either fundraise, you know, give me money now or I won't do this at all anymore. Um... 
that that I think is unfair. Uh, I do the podcast a lot for my own reasons, as well as for helping out others, and so that simply wouldn't be true. Uh, I've, as I've shown by continuing career opportunities for seven years after any payments uh, were made on that, there's a reason I do that myself. But it sure would be nice if I could find a way to let people help me out uh, with my podcast funding. The fact is, it's hard to ask for money. It's hard to ask for money in a lot of different ways. Uh, I had gotten over it with computers consulting. I, I'm sort of okay with it in new media consulting, but when it comes to asking for help from people I've never met, people I've never seen face to face, people who only listen to me through these little earbuds stuffed in their ears, uh, I find it really difficult. I I want to make sure that I'm providing them a significant amount of value that would encourage them to support the podcast. Unfortunately, as many of you podcasters know, getting feedback from your listeners can be just nearly impossible. Uh, I get some great letters over the years, um, some really amazing emails and notes have come to me about how career opportunities has affected people's lives, and I really, en- really enjoy that. I, they're just a little bit few and far between, to the point you can't quite put your finger on the pulse of what the average listener is experiencing when they listen to your podcast. So so I floated the boat about the Patreon. Um, I have not launched any Patreon yet. I was basically asking the listeners for their advice and what milestones to set up, what rewards they might be interested in that I could provide. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's kind of tricky. I haven't really heard much back, unfortunately, which is really not a surprise. Um, with the limited amount of feedback you get from people, silence is not necessarily that surprising when you put out a call for that. So I'm going to have to figure out something on my own. Do I go ahead and launch the Patreon myself and see if actually having something in place will cause people to interact with it or not? And, you know, down the road I may have to decide. We're coming up on our 10th anniversary of podcasting, which means it should be, oh, I think the 12th, no, 12th or 14th of writing the column, because it was written before it was podcast. Actually, 97, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, so seven years, actually, before it, it was started podcasting. So that would actually mean, wow, 2007 would be 10 years. Yeah, so about 12 years, 12 or 11 years. So uh, it's been going on for a long time, and... Uh, Times change, things change, people's change. Um, so it's gonna it's gonna take a little uh, thought about what might happen with that in this Patreon, and see if there's some other ways that I might raise some fundings in that regard. I'd be interested, obviously, if you have had any experience with Patreon. I I have some knowledge of them through some of the YouTubers I watch, uh, from which I learned a lot uh, over these last several years about running on a YouTube channel and and podcasting in general. Um, they are much bigger people. They have much larger subscriber bases than I do. So I can relate some of their ideas back to mine, but not all of them. And that's made it a little bit difficult. The fact is, too, uh, because I have so many podcasts, people often ask me, oh, so how do you keep all those balls in the air at once? And the fact is, I often tell them, you don't. Um, For every project that's currently active and really busy, there's two or three more that are lying follow. They're just kind of sitting there idling along. There's not a lot happening with them. Uh, perhaps it's the career camp events, which are basically happening about once a year. So between those events, there's, there's not a lot going on. I don't have to pay a lot of attention to it. And that's how I do it. I pay attention to those things that need my attention at the time and let the other things just kind of idle along until they re-energize in some way, shape, or form. Um, that seems to serve me well over the years. I have found that I like to have a lot of different projects going at once, and that's one way I have found to manage that flow. Yeah, every once in a while you end up with several projects that all of a sudden become very, very active at the same time, and you thank your lucky stars and you deal with it and push through it and enjoy those moments of really busy uh, times in your life. Now, if you've been reading the blogs for any time, listening to the podcast for any time, you will notice that I, I have started switching over to lots and lots and lots of video. I've really been focusing a lot of my attention there on producing video, video podcasts, as well as my YouTube channel. And I think it's important that a, a lot of us investigate that avenue. One of the things that, that got me doing more YouTube is I, um, 
my son started watching almost exclusively YouTube. In this, ca in this case, the gaming videos, Minecraft videos first, and then further gaming videos after that. And I started to learn about some of the personalities and the, and the bigger um, YouTubers out there and how they organize their channels and the type of content they produced. This sort of enlightened me, I'll use that term, in how to produce a large amount of video content sustained over a long period of time uh, in a variety of ways, and, and I'll get into that in a minute. But what it also meant was that I began to really see how important it was to have a YouTube channel, if for one important reason, and that is ease of monetization. Yes, the money isn't huge unless you have lots and lots of subscribers, but the fact is you can use AdSense to monetize YouTube videos much more quickly and easily than you could ever monetize podcasts. Podcasts, because of their very nature, require you to go out and find a sponsor, go out and find the advertisers, sell those sponsors, sell those advertisers, produce the content that goes into your podcast. It It's too difficult for most people who are just doing podcasting to have a bit of fun. Uh, to try and develop an entire advertising framework around your podcast is really, really difficult. Um, I've been involved with one network in the past, and while it worked fine, it wasn't quite my thing. There were some issues with it that didn't appeal to me. Uh, I didn't feel I had quite enough control, um, and I also don't feel I was of the right size to be engaging with those people that I was networking with. The smaller people in a network always kind of get short shrift. You hope that by linking up with a larger podcast, you know, it's going to float all boats higher, but it's not always the case. The big podcasts end up taking the biggest part or the biggest share of the profits, and there's just not that much to go around. So with YouTube being able to easily monetize it, I've also come to believe, you know, with devices like the Roku and the Chromecast and other ways of getting YouTube right on your television set, which is something... I've always said about podcasting, you've got to get on TV, and I don't mean on broadcast TV, I mean on the physical box that's in everybody's house. That is one way of really spreading the word about your podcast, because it's simply a device that's there. I can produce 1080p videos uh, that go up on my big screen TV, they look really nice, they sound really nice, and it's easy for people to browse through them and play them there. Using I use a Chromecast now, which I really, really love. Um... So that's been one reason why I went to video. The other reason is I just like to show people. I'm a theater person at heart. My degree is actually in theater. And I like to show people things. And I think that's especially true for the gardening podcast. You'll notice Career Opportunities has remained audio. I really don't see any particular reason to sit there showing my face reading my column. That doesn't, doesn't seem worthwhile to me. But for a gardening podcast, you want to show off the flowers and the plants and what you're doing and how you're making potting soil and, and building new containers or retrofitting beds or anything like that. It just lends itself much more easily to video. Along with that, obviously, the talk, any talk that I do, whether it's career-based, new media-based, whatever, I record that. That produces video content for my blogs and my podcast, to which then oftentimes I'll also release an audio version for those people who just want to listen. Recently, I've started producing um, video versions of my audio podcast, and this is merely a way of introducing my YouTube channel subscribers to content they may not have otherwise come across in audio format, like Career Opportunities. I haven't yet got around to doing it for every podcast. I've been kind of testing the waters with it to see how many quote-unquote views those, um, those podcasts get. Uh, again, I feel a little odd doing that, putting audio on YouTube, but in some cases, people have their favorite sites and their favorite locations for entertainment, and if YouTube is that place, because it is a social network in itself, then I sort of need to have my content there regardless of whether it's audio, video, or a mixture of both. So I've started doing that recently as well. We'll see how that experiment works out. I am pretty much sold, though, on YouTube and or whatever follows YouTube in the, in the cycle of tech bust and boom um, because it does allow me to, to really have my own television channel. Much like podcasting initially gave us our own radio stations and radio networks, um, YouTube gives us our own chance to have a TV channel. And I think that is amazing. I'm always... Um, promoting that to people is a way of getting the word out about whatever they're doing, whether it's a charity, a Kickstarter campaign, a business, their book, whatever. 
you have this great tool at your fingertips that today requires nothing more than a smartphone to really take high quality video and put it directly on YouTube available for anyone who wants to subscribe. So if you're not using YouTube already, I would highly encourage you to do that. I think you'll find that while there is a tiny bit of overlap between your audiences there, you'll find an entirely new audience there on YouTube. And it's great too because you can simply use the same video you put on YouTube goes into your podcast feed and gets served up to your subscriber base as it stands right now. It's sort of a double usage or a triple usage if you consider social media and everything else of the content you're already creating. So I sort of have to think why wouldn't you do it? So that's it for this Dog Days of Podcasting podcast, audio as it may be, me sitting here talking to you, whispering in your ears as I often describe it. Hope it's been fun for you. Hope it made you think just a little bit about new media and podcasting in general and things that you might be doing with your podcast. We'll be back tomorrow with the next installment of the Dog Days of Podcasting. For those of you listening out of the blue, you can find out more about the Dog Days of Podcasting at dogdaysofpodcasting.com. There you'll find links to this show as well as all the other people who are participating in this 30 podcast in 30 days challenge. This podcast is being released through my blog and podcast, Careers in New Media, at douglasewelch.com. That's Douglas, E W E L C H dot com. There you find links to Careers in New Media as well as the Gardener's Notebook, Career Opportunities, Technology IQ, and My Word, all the different blogs and podcasts that I do. Hope you're having a great night. Thanks for joining me here in my Los Angeles garden here in the San Fernando Valley. I hope your week is going great. We'll talk to you next time.